Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Gar Sturdivant. I'm the uh, senior planner with the municipality of Chester. Thank you, uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I'll just do sort of a brief introduction here, and then I'm going to turn things over to, uh, to David to go run through most of the, uh, the presentation. Um, but uh, Basically, um, what, what you've come to this evening is a, a presentation on the ongoing uh, built form and character defining elements study for Chester Village. Uh, this work is being done in support of the ongoing village plan review. And so that's a review of our current uh, secondary planning strategy and land use bylaw. And uh, obviously a piece of that is architectural control and building design. And uh, we thought that um, uh, internally as staff, we, we could definitely use some, some expertise, and so we've gone out and, uh, and, and uh, hired uh, FBM, and I'll, I'll let David introduce the team. We've got a sort of a multifaceted team that, that FBM has brought along with them, um, and, uh, and, and so they're uh, leading this study, which will help uh, basically, uh, in, in, once it concludes, uh, to inform that village plan where you'll give us some recommendations to implement in terms of architectural control and, and design guidelines, those kinds of things. Um, so without further ado, I'll uh, turn it over to David. Thank you, Garth. Uh, oh, I'll just mention we are live streaming on YouTube. Uh, we have uh, at least one or two participants online. Uh, but just so everyone knows, we are recording this session. Uh, if you have any concerns with that, please let us know. If you're uh, we'll try to address those. To take our masks off then? You don't have to. No, <laughs> that's up to your personal comfort. <laughs> uh, but yes, we are live streaming it. So this uh, will be available on YouTube afterwards. And anyone you know could make a meeting and they will want to listen to those presentations. Uh, that's it. I'll try to make it pretty good. Um, so I am David Patterson. I'm a planner with Ballard Wolf Mitchell. Uh, we're an architecture firm based out of Halifax. Uh, but we're multidisciplinary. Uh, I'm a planner at the firm, uh, and we're joined with architects. Uh, so Adam Lee is an architect in our office. Uh, we also joined with Novitas and Jokaris, and they are a heritage consultancy out of Lindenburg. And we have Laura Legresley. Yeah, yeah, Laura Legresley, uh, from Novitas and Jokaris as well, uh, who is, has that heritage expertise. Uh, and we have Brianna Maxwell, who's a planner at FBM, also joining us. You may have met Brianna at the front door. Uh, and uh, not here, but also part of the team is Emmanuel Nicolescu, who is a planner with CBCL. Uh, you may have been, uh, spoke with Emmanuel previously on working on the traffic study for Chester Village. So he is looking a lot at the character of streets in, in the village. Uh, I thought it also might be worthwhile if you don't mind. Uh, area Councillor Eric Wells is also in the group. So if you have any hard questions for Eric, <laughs> I, I know he wants them. <laughs> uh, oh, thank you. This is my little button. Okay. Oh, well, I'll talk a little bit louder for us. And sorry, I didn't introduce Jennifer, is on the IT with the municipality. Oh, uh, Kieran Hunt, uh, who I uh, didn't mention. Uh, Kieran Hunt is the plan studio. And there is Brian Arnott. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Arnott is with Novi Disney as well. And he was traveling with me this morning. Uh, let's see if I have this working. Oh, right it there. <laughs> it worked earlier. It worked earlier. We'll turn it off and on again and see if it works. Okay. If not, would you feel just advance those for me, Jennifer? Sure. Okay. There we go. Uh, and so we wanted to have sort of two components of the event visit tonight. Uh, 
we have uh, areas for comments and one-on-one conversations in more open house format. But we also thought it was really important to have this group discussion as well to go through some of the materials and also have some back and forth. Uh, as Garth mentioned, the, the goal of this study is to start to understand objectives or definitions for community character in Chester Village. Uh, and as we get into, that's a bit of an ambiguous concept. So we're trying to maybe lend a little bit more focus on what's traditionally an ambiguous concept. Um, in terms of the agenda for tonight, uh, we've done our introductions. I'll give a little bit of a project overview, uh, which we've already kind of gone over a little bit um, in terms of the relation to the uh, planning and review. Um, and other components of the presentation is looking at guiding principles and the proposed guiding principles that we've developed for this process to see if we were getting those right. We've also provided an analysis of what we have uh, thought to be the character defining aspects of Chester Village. We want to get thoughts from people as to whether we got those right or if there's anything that we missed. And finally, and probably most importantly, uh, is a chance to discuss what we're calling objectives at this point. What are the, the key objectives that the community members are bringing forward as what needs to be uh, kind of enshrined uh, in terms of considering character? So we'll get into all these a little bit more now. That's the overview. Uh, in terms of the project overview, as Garth mentioned, the, uh, the work is supporting the plan review for Chester Village. So one of the key products of that plan review is likely to be revisions to the land use bylaw and the planning strategy for Chester Village. And we realize those are sort of technical terms uh, and most people don't have a lot of interaction with the land use bylaw. But essentially the land use bylaw is the set of very specific rules by which new development is either permitted or not permitted. Uh, so for example, if you're building a house, you can build a house that's 30 feet tall, but you can't build a house that's 60 feet tall. Uh, land use bylaw determines that threshold between what you can build and what you can't build. Uh, and in the case of Chester Village, there's regulations around what kind of siding you can have on your building, uh, what height your building is, how big or small your front yards and side yards are. Uh, those are the kinds of things that are part of the land use bylaw. So in terms of the, what we'll be producing through the study is on the one hand, an analysis of what we see as the character defining um, elements. And that's really supported through this conversation to make sure we get that right. And then also uh, some of these defining objectives or recommendations for how future development in Chester Village can be compatible with the, the character that we're looking for. Uh, the bottom is a very simple timeline of our project. Uh, we started back in winter 2022. Uh, you might notice some of the photos that we took. Those were from February 2022 when we sort of kicked off the project. Uh, and we're now in spring 2022 identifying objectives. And our next stage in this work is to propose recommendations to staff and counselors for, uh, for this uh, manager's bylaw review. Uh, and that's looking to happen in summer 2022. And as part of that process, we are intending to have another meeting with community members. That's likely going to be a, a video meeting. Um, so probably not an in-person meeting like we're having here, but we're looking to have a video meeting at some point uh, in the next few months. And so in order to support that, we didn't want to get everyone's email addresses if you'd like to stay involved. So if we didn't get your email address, please, uh, please let us know and we'll send you a note as to what that next step is happening. Uh, moving along, uh, one thing that some folks might be aware of is there was a plan review survey in summer 2021 that had 236 respondents. And some of the questions in that survey was asking people what they thought were the key aspects of the Chester look. Uh, and when describing the Chester look, the things that people focused on the most um, in the sort of multiple choice questions there was that the waterfront, the dwellings or houses, 
and the trees and landscape are what's really critical to the Chester look. Uh, some of the other options that were in that survey were things like signage or the kinds of stores that were in the village. So predominantly when people are thinking about the Chester book, they're thinking about the connection to the water, they're thinking about the houses and the landscaping. They're not so much thinking about what the shops are downtown or what the signage is. Uh, <clears throat> and related to that landscaping, uh, concepts around tidiness, uh, pride of place, green spaces and gardens were very important, uh, as was the walking experience. So pathways, sidewalks, uh, there was cited uh, the traditional architectural styles uh, in Chester Village, as well as the numerous historical buildings in the village. Uh, people also cited the low height of buildings and the connection to the ocean, to the wharves, and uh, parks, the Leo Pool, um, that connection to water. Is really good. So that's what we had to start off with. That's what we knew is, is kind of sentiment. And, I expect most people would agree that covers kind of a lot of the ideas about the Chester. Uh, if we can move on. No, there's some of the things. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, one thing that we thought was really critical to discuss as part of this process is differentiating between those two terms of heritage and character. Uh, and we brought up this idea of, of bylaws before. And one thing about the word heritage is that's often associated with the heritage properties bylaw. So in Chester Village, there are numerous properties and specific buildings that are registered as heritage. And any exterior changes to those buildings has to go through a uh, committee and council process to be approved. Uh, so there's a more rigorous process for heritage buildings Whereas the majority of Chester Village is not registered as heritage. Uh, and so essentially it's uh, what you do with your property is as long as you're in conformance with the general rules, you're generally approved to do that work. Uh, so that's the kind of distinction between heritage and non-heritage. But when we thought of the word character, that has much more general connotations. So a lot of the character of Chester Village uh, might have to do with the connection to Salem, the connection to summer residence, uh, the connection to the landscape, uh, the kinds of streets, feeling of the streets. And all of those things are a little bit beyond what you would find in heritage bylaw, but they're certainly part of the character. Uh, so character is a more general concept. And uh, for this work we're citing, uh, the American Planning Association's document called Measuring Community Character. And there's an interesting quote from that document. Uh, and this is looking at certain conversations happening across North America. Uh, and that quote is that the average citizen understands community character on an intuitive level. That is, she knows it when she sees it. Uh, and I think, <laughs> I think that's an interesting idea because uh, we've been having these conversations about, you know, whether it's a specific uh, new building proposed or being built, and people are saying, you know what, I just the feel of it doesn't feel right. It doesn't it doesn't fit the character of the village. And what we're trying to do through the study is to kind of drill down and say, okay, what do you really mean by that? And you know, if you were to to sort of codify it, what does that mean? Uh, the character. And so it's desirable to objectively understand character characteristics rather than rely on sort of one by one intuitions about specific projects. And uh, another way to think about character is, is often in sort of what we're calling three categories. And this document sort of talked about uh, different professions. So people here who are architects or in the urban design profession will tend to say, well, character is all about building design and building style. Uh, whereas if you speak to a landscape architect, they might say, well, character is really about the trees and the topography and the landscape. Uh, whereas if you were to talk to a sociologist or an artist, they might say, well, you know, it's really about the, uh, the culture of the community and the social values and that kind of thing. So you can think about what we're proposing in this study is to think about character among three dimensions. One being the architectural or building design dimension, the other being the landscape or topography and connection to 
connection to the land and sea dimension, and third being that social dimension of the cultural dimension. And so as I go through, we'll be kind of citing those two categories. Uh, when it comes to proposed guiding principles for compatible new development, we have developed these four principles that, that reflect those ideas. Uh, the first uh, principle for new development is that new development is appropriate and complementary. Uh, that is to say, it contributes positively to the historical context of the village and the scale that relates to site, topography, and neighboring buildings. The second principle is that new development is sensitive to the landscape and the seascape. <clears throat> and by that, we mean that it respects the landscape the locations of buildings, uh, adjacent buildings, tree cover, vegetation, rock walls and fences, and also with a consideration to the views to and from the ocean as well as access to the water. Uh, the third principle is timeless and authentic design. And this is one that is a little bit interesting because it's talking about uh, style of building, but that's to consider principles of proportion, form, composition, and texture. Uh, and also to avoid in design pastiche or what you might call flow architecture. So that would be, uh, for example, one material imitating that of another, or uh, the idea that lots of different building typologies or building languages kind of come together and it's hard to kind of tell exactly what the style is of a building. Uh, so that would be sort of a pastiche or a flow architecture where it's, it's ambiguous as to what it's actually trying to be. And the, the final principle that we have in this list that we're proposing is around continuity and change. And that new development respect, respects the historical context while also reflecting contemporary needs, such as the needs for housing options, uh, for a reduced carbon footprint, for durability, and for accessibility. So these are some of those considerations that buildings built 100 years ago may not have had the same ideas around durability or accessibility Durability is not a good example because those buildings are durable. <laughs> but uh, around carbon footprint and energy efficiency or around accessibility, that's often a challenge in, uh, in older buildings. Move on to the next one. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, and this is when I was speaking to fellow. Uh, but this was a document, uh, the Standards and Guidelines for the Conservation of Historic Places. This is a document produced by Parks Canada, and it's uh, a very general set of guidance and standards for working in historic places. So this document would be applying to national historic sites, uh, as well as heritage buildings. But it's also <clears throat> generally, if you're thinking of a place that's historic, it still has uh, principles. And so if we're thinking of Chester Village, which is obviously a historic place, uh, you know, there's over 100 buildings in Chester Village that date from prior to 1900. Uh, there's a lot of history here. And so we're looking to standard of method, which is really providing guidance at a very general level towards what you should do in a place to conserve its heritage value or historic value, uh, while also being open to new additions and new, new buildings being added to that historic place. So I'll read this out. Uh, standard 11 states uh, as guidance to conserve the heritage value and character defining elements when creating new additions to a historic place or anything related to a new construction. Second part is, is very interesting, which is to make the new work. So that would be the new building, the new addition, and so on. Make the new work physically and visually compatible with, subordinate to, and distinguishable from. The historic place. So we kind of circled those three words, the first one being compatible. So what's, what are the elements of compatibility of new with old? Uh, how can new be subordinate to, uh, to old? And that doesn't always necessarily mean smaller, but it means that the new doesn't overshadow or obscure uh, what's important to the character of the place. And the third being that new works or new projects are distinguishable from the historic place. And so that is, in a sense, to be, to not necessarily mimic those historic features of older buildings, 
but to be open to contemporary design in a way that's complementary. Uh, and part of the reason could be if you're thinking of, of a historic site, if there was a new visitor center, for example, and it looked the same as the building that was built 200 years ago, you could see yourself as a visitor saying, oh, this is a great historic building. And then you ask them the question of, oh, that was built five years ago. <laughs> That's that uh, that way that a place can be historic and storytelling, but also have contemporary design. So it's not it's not necessary that every new building looks the same as how we built things hundred years ago. Is there anything on any of those principles or standards and guidelines that people have thoughts about? I wouldn't mind taking a quick break here to, to give an opportunity for feedback, questions, or comments. Yes. Um, the uh, not to say with manner as my mother said, that's something I will put a lot of big words to sound good, but it's all very qualitative. Yeah. It's, um, that's what every, everybody is going to pick. It's very difficult. Yeah. yeah. Do you mean the things that I'm saying, or do you mean architecturally in the village? No, no, in person. Yeah. And I think I'm, I'm starting at more of the principal level, but where I'd like to bring this is to a conversation where we might talk about you know, materials or kind of shape of roofs. And uh, where, where I want to bring us is towards very specific objectives that you might have, and Sid might have a different objective. Uh, but I, I want to kind of get into that conversation after we speak to the principles to speak about like specific details. Are you really, what are you really interested in talking about? Um. But, um, all of these things need to get uh, actualized in some fashion. That it either is or is not acceptable because yeah. I rely on the judgment of or somebody else that may exercise it in a capricious way. Is that or in an arbitrary way? Well, I have opinions about that movie, but I don't have any authority. Yeah. My opinion is only based in the and what you see in light of looking at the yeah. I think what you're saying so far sounds really great. And what I'm looking for is what in planning errors, like when you get Nantucket or Banff, and the place becomes so monotonous. It's so overruled that it's not interesting. Goal for me is to like the words like subordinate and sensitive and stuff that all makes perfect sense with the scales, right? But that it leaves some room for leaves some room for playing. And I know I believe it's all really in the details. So it's a lot of it is materials and it boils down to a really subjective thing. Like you get Westmount in Montreal. That put strict planning in in place decades ago and the whole town is fantastically preserved but it's it's very literal like you have to have a committee to go in front of and you want to do a certain chimney and they go no 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 that's impossible and then you go well you just accepted it for the library and then they go oh yeah i just do it anyway it's just unavoidably there's unavoidably subjective thing so it's this really tricky balance in my view about a bit of a light hand to not be overruling where it becomes like Banff and it's boring. Or for God's sakes, like the Ottawa National Capital Commission has made the most egregious errors over decades that I've ever seen. Sort of a light hand and yet avoiding like houses that look like a giant mausoleum in the middle of a cemetery. Yeah, yeah. that's the tricky. That's, I think, the tricky thing too, is because I mean, there's there's something sacred about, you know, I own this property, I'm allowed to build a house that meets my needs and meets my aesthetics. Yeah. Uh, there's something sacred to owning your own property. And then plus right now there's very loose guidelines. And yeah. then what happens within the loop, the guidelines are loose enough that it allows some ugly stuff to happen. Yeah. 
where a bit of a bit of uh, of, of uh, uh, a bit of discretion would allow some common sense alterations for a certain context, like you have uh, you know, somebody pays a fortune for 600 feet of frontage, and you're uh, you know you have to stick on a small footprint, and then unavoidably the thing's going to be bulging out, not very. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's that's the challenge too. And, and one thing about those developments that are you know, approved under construction is that they they ticked all the boxes of the, the rules for development. Um, and so what we're kind of trying to do here is to give some suggestions for how those rules can be revised. Uh, but what's the right level of, of fingerprint, I guess you could say. What's the right amount of influence? Uh, because right now there are certain restrictions. Uh, and I would, I would kind of classify the land use bylaw in Chester Village as being sort of a bit moderate or sort of light handed in what it allows and what it doesn't allow. Um, but maybe the things that it focuses on are not quite the right things. Uh, maybe there should be something to add or something subtracted. I dread an aesthetic committee, and yet I think it's essential at the same time. And I wish it would be, I, I sort of dream there could be a committee where you could have a conversation and some common sense could be applied. Yeah, whatever, whatever that means. I don't know if that's I think, you know, probably impossible. Um, I wouldn't say it's impossible. <laughs> it's, it's not what there is right now. Uh, but I mean, I think there might also be a question too of, uh, you know, if you're putting an addition on the back of your house, is that the same as building a new house that's 4,000 square feet? Is there a threshold at which there, are there different thresholds at which there be more scrutiny, for example? Uh, I'm gonna move on, but I, I really, this is exactly what we wanna be talking about. <laughs> uh, but I'm gonna keep on moving along with some of the observations that we made uh, as our kind of outside eyes coming into Chester Village and uh, make sure that that uh, jives with uh, your lived experience in the village. Uh, so the first is a, a map that we produced. I had some conversations with folks on it as well over here. Uh, we've identified a couple of major character areas that we've described in Chester Village. Uh, the first being uh, indicating green in the center is the central village. And that it corresponds to a few zoning types within Chester. Uh, so Chester Village has uh, a central village residential zone as well as a central village commercial zone. And that's encompassed by that green sort of log. Uh, and that is the traditional street grid. So the street grid in Chester was established in 1760. Uh, and you know, over time there's been development, there's been new houses that have grown in that last 260 years. Um, but that original grid is still apparent, and we have, you know, some generally modest houses throughout the area. Uh, generally, those houses sort of range from about 1,000 square feet to 3,000 square feet, I'm going to say. Uh, usually that one and a half to two and a half stories in height. Uh, but one thing that we did notice as we were traveling through is there's definitely what we call an activity core, and it's indicated with the hatching. Uh, on the map. Uh, so if you're on Queen Street or Duke Street or, or Pleasant Street, uh, what we really noticed in those areas was those were kind of, we call them the activity core. That's where there's generally a little bit more of a buzz going on. Uh, so that's where shops are. That's where houses tend to be a bit closer to the street, a bit closer together. Uh, those are the areas where the village has sidewalks. Uh, you know, during race week, that's the place that's nuts uh <laughs> and that's you know where your uh your bars and restaurants are and that kind of thing. uh so those that's kind of a bit of a sub area of the central village is the activity core where things are are a little bit more happening not that things aren't happening elsewhere but but that's really the core uh as well in the big four purple blobs that's an area that we've termed the estates area and we actually borrowed the term estates from the zoning that applies there. So the, the zoning bylaw from 2004, uh, and possibly before, they might predate that zoning bylaw, uh, but those have traditionally been called the estates uh, in the zoning. Um, I had a conversation today that you know, maybe the term estates is a little bit 
uh, not the, quite the right connotation, uh, but going from the zoning bylaw, those are the areas that uh, we found tended to have larger houses and larger lots. The, the minimum lot size in that area is three quarters of an acre, uh, but many of those lots are, are three, four, five, six acres in size. Uh, and so we often see sort of a house on the hill in that area where there's a greater view of the water. Uh, and also interestingly to think about is it's mainly the houses in the estates area that are viewable from the water. So if you're out in the boat, you would be really seeing those houses. And that's that's the face of the village um, from the water. Um, also indicated on this map, um, which are sort of smaller zones that we thought was important to call out was two waterfront zones that exist in Chester Village. So indicated in these uh, sort of blue bars uh, here, here, along here, and also along the peninsula and Front Harbor is the waterfront residential zone. Uh, and that is a little bit different from the other zones in that any buildings on those zones need to be a bit shorter than in other residential zones. And also on your lot, you're limited in how wide your house can be. So it's your, your building on that lot can only be 20% the width of the property. So if you own a property in the waterfront residential zone and you want to build a 30 foot wide house, you essentially need to have a lot that's 150 feet wide to make that building. Uh, the, so that's one waterfront zone. The other waterfront zone, which is a small area uh, in this sort of round blob on Back Harbor, is the marine industrial zone. And in this zone, there is uh, the only permitted uses are marine related, so things like uh, boat building and boat storage and boat repair, as well as wood shops. So that's actually the only area in the village where you're not permitted. That along with institutional areas is the only areas where you're not allowed to build a dwelling. And also in Gale, this is kind of outside the scope of this study. There's also a uh, highway three development area. So properties along highway three are also subject to uh, the specific requirements in the 90s bylaw. Move along. And am I talking too fast, too slow? Am I putting you to sleep? No? Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so we have, and these are on our boards as well, when we were uh, kind of analyzing Chester Village and, and visiting and traveling through, we identified a total of 27 uh, character, over fine character defining elements. Uh, and actually give a lot of thanks to, to Laura who, who helped to develop these a little bit too and please contribute as, as we go. Uh, but I'm gonna quickly run through them. Um, in terms of these sort of 27 character defining elements. Again, we split those up into the, the site and landscape category, the building category, and then the social and cultural categories. Uh, so in terms of the site design and topography, uh, as I'm sure everyone's aware, Chester is quite hilly. Uh, so most properties have some kind of rate change where either the street is above or below where your house is. So you're always dealing, almost always dealing with a property that's got you know, slopes or terraces. Yes. Yeah. Also, uh, contributes to this whole issue of height, um, height requirements within the town. Um, so when you have these, these lots that are sloped or called drop lots, um, yeah, it, it changes the height drastically. You have to depending on where you're starting to do this. Yeah, so the streets down here, your house might be up here, and then if your house is two and a half stories, that's not what's up there. So, uh, or as, alternatively, if your street's up here and your house ground floor is down here, then your house just goes up to here. <laughs> Unless you fill it in 10 feet deep before yeah. you apply for a building permit. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. And that happens. I, I assume that happens. Uh, Something else that we discussed a little bit was that street grid and how there is sort of different types of streets. Uh, you might be on, say, Tremont Street, which is a bit of a quieter street versus, say, Queen or Duke Street, which are relatively busier. So some of those character aspects are kind of kind of very one. Uh, a lot of people are on private roads as well, which is a whole different kind of field. 
the street. Uh, and those building setbacks also kind of change from the, the sort of center of the village with building setbacks quite close to the street and you have a bit more of an urban feel. Uh, but as you get further away from the center of the village, you get more landscaping and you can have more buildings that are set more back from the street. And as part of that, we really found that the trees and landscaping was, was so critical to, to what Chester Village is all about. It's a fairly, I would say, pastoral uh, place. So if you were to contrast Chester to Lunenburg, for example, uh, Lunenburg has a very urban feel where it's houses close together and buildings close to the street. Uh, Chester, it's much more kind of a cottage in a, a large property for the most part. And those gardens and landscaping and trees are really an important part of, of the village. Uh, to some extent, there's there's houses that you can barely see from the street because there's so much landscaping between the street and them. Uh, and along with that, uh, we found there's lots of really decorative and really attractive fences, hedges, and stone walls throughout the village. And gardens and plantings is a key part of that, as well as uh, pathways and walkways. And once again, coming back to the access to the water's edge is, is so critical to the culture and place of, of Chester. Uh, and we've also noted there are a number of prominent churches, uh, parks and main gardens in the village. You can move on to the next one. Uh, this is going into building design, so more specifically looking at houses. Uh, the predominant residential scale, as I mentioned, is, is about one and a half to two and a half stories, generally. There are a significant number of houses from pre 20th century. And in terms of style, uh, and there is uh, our board number two up there does list some of those, uh, the legacy of different styles in Chester Village. Uh, there is a strong New England influence in the styles of buildings in Chester Village. Uh, lots of Cape Cod elements, uh, though there's also uh, lots of other styles that are also legacy. So it's a bit of an eclectic, stylistically, it's a little bit eclectic in Chester Village. Uh, there is many peaked roofs, so most houses have a peaked roof and mostly a steeper rather than a shallower peaked roof. And distinctive chimneys was something else that we really noticed. Uh, to a lot of, a lot of simple chimneys on the houses in Chester. Uh, dormers are common, especially shed style dormers. So a shed style dormer is, is what we see uh, right here and here, and also actually right there. That's where the roof kind of pops up to make a dormer. Uh, and there's also uh, what we're calling uh, aggregated massing. So there's lots of houses that might have had additions over the years. So you end up having the original house and then additions onto it. Well, so you can sort of think of aggregated styles or aggregated massing in the houses. Uh, and uh, both out open and closed in verandas are very common. And there's also lots of outbuildings, uh, garages, these are uh, for the village. We can move on to the next one. And this is just a few more notes on building design. One other thing that we, we really commented on was there's a fairly minimalist, there's kind of minimalism in decoration of facades. The houses in Chester Village tend to be fairly plain and simple. Uh, there's a lot of houses with a white or natural wood, fill, wood finish, though there's definitely exceptions to that. There are, uh, there are colorful houses for sure. And cladding is predominantly horizontal wood siding, either, uh, either shingles or other materials. Um, but there are, we also did notice there were some examples of other materials that were used. Uh, there is, for example, one, one stucco house that we noticed uh, which was kind of surprising to us because that's not actually permitted in the land use bylaw anymore. <laughs> um, so there is, you know, occasionally you'll see a stone or a stucco clad house. I have not seen a brick house in Chester Village. On the highlight, okay, yeah. But I did not within the, the central village area. And then there's also a prominent use of six over six windows. So a six over six window is basically if you have Two parts of your window, your top part has a row of three and a row of three, and then your bottom part has a row of three and a row of three. So that's six over six. And that kind of concludes our list of architectural elements that we found with common houses in Chester. We can move on to the next one. 
The next one, this is a bit of a shorter list because I think it's a little bit more up for discussion. But this is that topic around social and cultural and community needs uh, and what kind of socially makes Chester Village unique. So one thing which I mentioned before, the large number of seasonal summer residents. Uh, we were here in February when we took these photos and I was really surprised. It's a fairly quiet village in February and it's really bustling in the summer. Uh, the village is generally quite tidy and well kept and, and has a lot of private place. Uh, there is that compact commercial and services area uh, in the commercial zone, uh, mainly along Pleasant and Queen and Duke. Uh, though there's also you know, Brown Valley Road and on Water Street, there's also some, some commercial areas there as well. And there's also and something that's, that's been in discussion recently. Uh, there is uh, there are some accommodations available in Chester Village. Uh, there's also some short-term rentals as well. And I know like Airbnb and the you know the perceived loss of, of rental housing uh, as a result of Airbnb is something that's also come up. So I'd be really open to having that conversation as well. By the way, I'm just going to mention that Chester's a kind of private place where it seems like nothing's happening and there's an intense amount of private socializing between houses and something about the density of the town. I've seen people rent or build outside the fabric where it's too far to get drunk and drive home. They end up selling and building in the town. Or I'll say with drinking and driving. Anyway, no, but there's a thing about there's a Anyway, it's, it's, it's a bit tight yeah. It's, it's a bit tight knit here. It's kind of walkable, and you kind of go and see what your neighbors are up to. I I didn't go that, but it's more social. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is it year round also, as well? Yeah. Year round. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We've seen a lot more kind of cold too in the last year. Yeah. 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 That's well, right. that's, yeah. At least the thirties and summer. Like I might have a hundred people for dinner in the summer, but seventy-five at Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. Larry Bear's on the That's right. Uh, I think uh, I have that place to stay. Uh, so I think where we want to, we really that's the conclusion of our sort of analysis of the information that we're putting out there. Uh, but we do have a number of what I'd say questions or topics to kind of pick your minds on. Uh, and that's questions about what should be our objectives moving forward uh, in terms of some of these topics that we've discussed. So in terms of site design in relation to context, what should be some of the objectives around uh, building lots, uh, building locations on properties? So the land use bylaw has certain requirements around the size of your front yard, the size of your, your side yards. Um, has there been any experiences where those have either worked out well or worked out poorly? Uh, and does there need to be an examination of where buildings are kind of located within a property? Uh, questions around landscaping, trees and fences and retaining walls. Right now there's really no kind of protection for landscaping or for trees on private property. Um, but we've identified that those are such a key part of, uh, of the character. Uh, so how, what are the goals that we could see uh, in terms of, of landscaping and new development that's complementary to what exists right now? Uh, what is the relationship to that street? So for wider, busier streets versus wider streets, uh, how, how do buildings relate to those areas? And then how do buildings and development relate to the water? Uh, who use the water? David's going to continue to let me, but feel free to jump in at any point here. This is supposed to be a discussion as well. So yeah. 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 I had a request online that if someone does ask a question, if you could review it, it to make oh, yes. it home. Or if you have a comment, maybe you can try and project a little bit louder for the people. Okay, yes. Thank you. Sorry about that. Yes. One really important thing is the historic fabric of the village is hemmed in by Route 3. Like you get traffic people straightening the road out 
and classically it just makes the traffic faster and the road noise louder and there are historic buildings on the other side of the highway which are to me like seem kind of a bit abandoned like i wish there were better traffic calming practices like uh, there was a historic railway bridge at Route Three in the corner that uh, that slowed cars down like crazy. They think anyway, just the traffic goes faster and faster. Yeah, yeah. I'll try to repeat that for the folks online. Uh, but that was a, a comment about traffic on on Highway Three and and traffic calming. Uh, obviously, that's a little bit outside the scope of what we're looking at in terms of kind of. But it's defining the fabric of the it's, village yeah. and letting it go to its full extent rather than being hemmed in by the road. Yeah. That's a really good point. Uh, I'm just gonna move on to the next one, if we can. And then in terms of questions around design elements for compatible new buildings, um, what are some of the objectives that we should be exploring around uh, siding, roof materials, and, and windows? Uh, so for example, you know that the current land use bylaw has a very specific requirement that when you build a building, you predominantly have to use horizontally oriented siding. Uh, so that means that you can build a house in, in brick or horizontal uh, oriented wood um, or potentially horizontally oriented metal siding or vinyl siding, but you wouldn't be able to do any of those things in a vertical orientation. And so I, I just picked up on that classification land use bylaw and I was kind of interested like, oh, that's, that's a very unique requirement. Uh, and I'd like to know if that's working out <laughs> uh, or if there's other, you know, if there were to be requirements around signing, would there be other, uh, other kinds of requirements? So I think that, I think that requirement, from my understanding, this may be earlier than this, because we're going to work in the back of the house. Okay. So it's built up in the post office. So okay. The, uh, the pencil to the eye. So yeah. That was the one and only. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, I think there's a story behind every rule like this. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, I think one question that, that we would have, you know, in 2022 is, is what's really important around materiality. Uh, so like I, I'll throw out some examples that you know some some municipalities would say that you know buildings above a certain size aren't allowed to have plant siding as as one potential example, uh, and that's kind of a set of choice saying you know we think that plant siding is a single quality material. That's somebody's opinion. I'm not going to say whether that's good or not, but that's the kind of thing that could be considered here. Uh, but yeah, I was just kind of, I thought it was interesting to bring up that that horizontal siding is, is where it was went specifically here. And I'm not sure if that's in 2022 where it should be in the future. I'm just thinking that vertical siding is, is quite often, uh, or the plan is not a small but if you put on vertical siding on something 33 feet tall, it's not quite the same thing. So maybe it is something. Church, but the uh, institutions. Uh, I actually don't know. I didn't look into the institutional zones that. that yeah. In, in general, we, we don't have currently have different rules for institutional use. Like that could be something that we could introduce. It's, it's certainly within the realm of possibility you know, to have different, similar to what David was suggesting in terms of. Residential over a certain size has a different set of rules. We could say institutional has a different set of rules. Commercial has you know different requirements. Um, and uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, yeah, that's that's the kind of thing that could really come out of this is you know there might be a certain set of judges for houses that are below a certain size. You know, say small houses are relatively easy, relatively straightforward to build, and maybe more affordable for mobility. Uh, whereas as you get larger houses and uh, maybe those restrictions change a little bit. I think there's a discussion around whether there's a uh, special or whether there's like technologies of sort of small people and large. <laughs> Would you ever consider changing to a smaller percentage of work inside? It, it is part of the characteristics. I think you do these kind of shows in eight houses in the last 15 years. 
Okay. It's all it's all up for debate. Yeah. So if yeah, okay. if, if, so if that's what that's kind of what we're looking for. If you if people ask me for where to sign my time, usually we can load it. And sure. you need to have to say no. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think the rule right now is um that vertical side it can't dominate. And so the way Garth has explained it to me in practice is that you can have up to 49 percent vertical side. <laughs> And, and to that point, just to quickly jump in, that is, is a part of the reason why we wanted David and the team to come in, because the way that's written, we're not sure that that really expresses the best, the best interest of what we're looking for. And if there's something, if there's a better way to write it, we should, we should do it that way. If, if there's certain examples that we don't want to say, we can clearly articulate those. And I, I, to me, that rule is one of the key pieces of what we have now as to what what we're hopefully going to get out of out of this work is and, and this was what we talked about early on in the uh when we were when we were bringing fbi on uh, on to do this work was you know a, a straightforward set of guidelines that are can be easily understood and generally agreed upon by hopefully most if not all of the members of the community and and it's a challenge don't get me wrong but, but that's yeah that's what we're looking to work toward i love shingles like look at lunenburg they wrap industrial buildings and shingles you get all kinds of funny massing you get massachusetts shingle style houses that are the the opposite very carefully detailed mansard roofs with all the all the pieces uh there's some housing types that might not be appropriate for shingles like a 60s bungalow might be better i mean this is the kind of thing where it takes you know, like you wish you could have a conversation uh, and it's not so literal it creates a problem yeah it's, it's specific it's sort of about a specific there's so many specifics to it it's almost like a site, uh, project by project conversation I mean, to me this is a kind of shingle style place basically but i don't know if it should be i mean i, I kind of wish it was 80 percent shingles or 90 percent shingles and then some other <laughs> stuff too yeah. uh and then actually just to build on what garth was saying about kind of the readability of the rules uh there's certainly some cases where you might go to a municipality and download their land use bylaw and you end up with a five minute page document. Uh, that's the case here in Uh <laughs> And you know, right now, the land use bylaw, I'm going to say it's probably about 50 or 70 pages, which is sort of average. But I would kind of suggest that it's a good idea that if you're a landowner, you should be able to comprehend the land use bylaw and sort of get a sense for, you know, the not have to hire an expert to interpret that. And so that's that question of you know, how, how complex do you want to get versus how um, there's a whole bunch of whereases and, and, <laughs> and it's, not, it's not just about architecture. Yeah. Oh. There's a lot of other provisions in there too around parking and other outside of architectural yeah. controls. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the things that we're talking about take up about five pages of that. <laughs> I find this difficult to articulate, but the village is in its, all its variety of structures and it's really in place to live here. Um, what we see in Halifax uh, is areas of the city that were attracted, maybe still are in the feeling, but uh, existing properties, we see some of the future. An existing relatively modest place gets torn down and replaced with a expansion yeah. in a uh, pejorative place. How to prevent that from happening here? So the, the appealing scale of development here uh, that exists in you know, relatively small houses doesn't get torn down and replaced with a I'm sorry, I don't care what kind of siding it is. Uh, maxed out to the uh, setback limits in their block coverage ratio, all car garage facing the street. Yeah, that's the sort of development that was fundamentally altered Chester, and it's the thing, it's the things that we see going on in Halifax and in the other places. The haircut was relatively limited. Yeah. You know, it's not a runaway, but I can see it becoming. And that's that and question. I think that would be, that would be, uh, I won't be the chair of the vertical or the bottom siding, but yeah. that uh, change in mass and 
and uh, that presence. Presence, yeah. And to the streets, but then change the nature of the way you Yeah. And how do you articulate that in the context of the zoning bylaw? That's why you guys go to universities. That's what's actually useful because, I mean, a couple of the things you said there about the, the, the two car garage on the street. You know, you get level 30 of those, and all of a sudden it's just a street or garage. Yeah. And, and those are the types of things that you can build language around. Yeah, that's the opposite of this gable house at the head of the front harbor where the guy read in the Wall Street Journal that front porches encourage conversation. And then some other New York guy reads the same article and comes up and starts talking to the guy on his front porch and they end up doing a business deal together. One of the things that can destroy our beautiful village is tearing down. We should be looking at some way to stop them. Yeah, and that's a it's a tough it's a tough thing to get to. No, it's not. It's just yeah. kind of the whole thing of heritage of research. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is an option. Uh, good. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I, let's talk about that. Like, what would a heritage precinct be in Chester Village? And is that desirable? I think it's a great way to maintain the heritage. We've got heritage challenges now. Yeah. And just remind me how that happens. Is that imposed on the owner because it's a uh, committee, or do I call it say, not like? Break some old and keeps the heritage. I don't believe so. I think guys might have more knowledge of the history, but it's usually an application by the property owner. So yeah, so there's it's basically uh, our, our current heritage property bylaw and, and program has been in place, and most of the registrations that we have were done sort of in the early to mid 90s, and we haven't had recent registrations. But from reviewing those files, and if we did have something new that came forward, at the time, there was a, well, the Heritage Advisory Committee did some investigation work and they actually approached property owners to ask if they were interested in registration. Um, my understanding is that the municipality would have the authority to register somebody, um, but that is not the practice that we do. So we would only register somebody if they consented to it. And we have a number that began the process and for one reason or another didn't finish it and, and those have never been, been registered. So. Um, that's how it works currently, uh, and the Heritage Conservation District would be uh, to take it a step a step further than that and, and impose that on an entire district or area in, in, in theory. So, so I lived in the 19, late 60s, early 70s, bungalow that's completely architecturally It's mercifully hit by a lot of vegetation. So, um, but if it were to be declared a heritage, Chester Village is to be declared a heritage district, what would that do to a much like me that's in a, a distinguished house? Next question. Yeah. I mean, that's, I think that's a, the tricky part about Chester is uh, I'm not as familiar with Lunenburg as, as maybe uh, as, uh, as Laura is, but it's. Uh, I don't want to say it's less attached, but it's a bit more maybe a plan that there is a variety of houses. You know, there's over 100 houses that are 20 years old or more, but there's also a whole bunch of houses from the 70s, 80s, 90s as well. And so how, so that, I think that's one of the tricky things about uh, this tool of a heritage conservation district is that the, the heritage of Chester Village is quite not quite dispersed. Uh, so there is uh, throughout the that's throughout the central village there are a number of, of heritage properties, but they're not all kind of. Uh, or if you look at the train station, which is on the other side of the highway, uh, so it, it would be, I would say, it would be a bit of a challenge to identify a heritage district. That'd be, I guess, what I would kind of put out there because when you look into that kind of tool, you do need to put it out. I think that's a radical and sort of silly idea in practical terms because you get some Chester houses that are basically sitting on a row of limestone blocks on dirt. I mean, they're structurally insubstantial and not planned out for what would practically be good, you know, the modern usage. But there are a number of 
really cohesive, excellent houses around here that I think speak to what the character of the village is. You could go pick out 20 or 30 of them easily, like whether those good houses could have an onerous covenant put on them. And kind of to jump on to what David was saying, is maybe the idea of heritage conservation is that it doesn't have to apply to the entire village. Um, in Bloomingbird, it's only blocks, really. Um, so it's not the entire community of Bloomingbird under this heritage conservation district. Um, but I think why we're here um, is because there was this discussion for a need um, for some, some, some sort of identification of Bloomingbird Chester without being that prescriptive. Um, so hopefully what we walk away with, or what you walk away with, is something a bit more qualitative than, than What really disturbs me is when you get a good historic house that has insensitive renovations done to it, like particularly crappy windows. <laughs> So would that be like vinyl windows or? Vinyl windows with inset grills set with the glass flush with the external envelope of the building. Like Leon Creer discussing how having a shadow line articulation of the window set back a little bit. And it looked, you know, it's little things like that that make a, make a house look interesting. That might not be immediately obvious, but when you look carefully. Yeah, yeah, it's very, very specific. Oh, and sorry, I haven't been repeating the questions as well for people online. I have a question from okay. online. <laughs> and I have to, who's the person on Google online? Ju uh, Julia Creighton. Okay, Julia, thank you for being here. And, and I hope the experience has worked for you. <laughs> We're kind of experimenting with the hybrid model. Julia's question is, is the Register of Heritage Properties able to be viewed by the public? Uh, please. A question was, uh, is there a... a Public register of heritage buildings. Uh, we actually have that in the room. Uh, I didn't have it on the slideshow. It's uh, in the room, Julia. <laughs> and by Julia, actually, if you are on the Voices and Choices website, uh, there is a download for a discussion paper which has all the materials. And about halfway through that, there is a map of the heritage properties in Chester Village. I want to say there's about 20 to 30. Yeah. Um, listed heritage buildings. Follow up question. If a house has a purple civic number, does that mean it has been registered and can't be torn down? Uh, no. So the maroon, oh, I'll say maroon, I'm not trying to correct, but, but what we call the maroon civic plate number, that was a um, uh, not directly tied to the heritage file. That was a project that we undertook as part of the Canada 150 celebrations. And so there were a number of homes, well, all the homes that were identified that were over 150 years old and those property owners were um, approached to see if they were interested and if they were, uh, then they were, they received a free uh, maroon uh, civic plate fee. Uh, Chester Municipal Heritage Society actually put together a little uh, brochure that you can take as a walking tour if you want around the village. We did identify properties outside of the village as well, but um, so there's a nice little uh, brochure with, uh, with inset photos and you can kind of give yourself a self-guided walking tour or you can just wander around and see the maroon signs, but it, that is not the same as a, a registered heritage property. Great question. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I, I think what we're, what we're speaking about a little bit, and I think this is back to what Sid was mentioning about, so uh, about having someone tear down a modest house and building something that's really large as being a problematic trend. Uh, so right now, the regulations are fairly uh, consistent, which is that if you have a certain size lot, uh, there is a percentage that you're allowed to build on. So you can build in some properties up to 30% of your lot, in some properties up to 40%, and some properties can uh, cover up to 50% of your lot. Uh, and that's based on the size of the lot. So if you have a very small lot in the central village, you can build up to 50% on top of your property. Is there any maximum limit on the size of the civic on the building? There is not that I was able to find. No, not currently. So, so, so you can build a 12,000 square foot house. Yeah. So what's to stop you coming and that being up to buy two lots? Yeah. 
That, that's uh, the possibility. Yeah, and it, actually, it's only the central that's building. Big, that's a big thing. That could possibly weigh things around that. Those people talk six hundred thousand, nine thousand, two hundred or two million. Yeah, for any place to sell. It's some kind of some kind of a uh, limit on aggregate size to help us to mitigate that problem because it is an issue in some places. And going, I wouldn't be surprised if some of us are here, yeah, either through lot consolidation or there are some very large lots that are significantly under built in that uh, you could put on 10,000 square foot. Yeah, stop them. Yes. And I'd like to bring up the idea of uh, duplexes as one example. Uh, so, you know, if you know, right now the rules allow you to build any size house as long as you have a large enough lot, uh, there is also uh, allowance for, for duplexes in, in uh, at least in the central village, yeah, for sure. Um, but then you have to have a distinct entrance. But then you know, is there just that building size kind of double if you're a duplex? And then I want to bring up the idea of, you know, is there a role for townhouses or say a duplex or a fourplex? Uh, is that something that you think would be desirable in the village or is that kind of out of character? No, no. It's all in the details. Like there's an issue with people living here and Housing's good, but it's all in the details. Like a duplex, like this one relatively new symmetrical duplex. It really looks like a duplex. Like I kind of wish they would have played it slightly differently, so it yeah. didn't look quite so symmetrical. Yeah. It's more than that. I don't. I have. At least, at least that will hurt. Yeah, so I think that's another question. Yeah, you know, yeah you know, that design and scale. You could take the same amount of money and say square footage and build an ugly building or a nice building. So it's really all the details. And ideally, it would be having being able to have a conversation with planning to use some common sense for some discretion. But that's a big ask because who's going to be on the committee? Yeah. Who are you talking yeah. to? Yeah, the duplex they built not too far from you just around the corner. But it's a large one. Yeah. And they have some use. That's not the one where somebody hung himself. It's the only one that's going to be. Moving along. It's a bit symmetrical with the Tamoy, but yeah, it's not. It's no, not yeah. Exactly. But I think. I think you're raising something that's really an interesting question, which is the, the as of right versus uh, discretionary routes. And so, sorry, this is kind of maybe getting into the technical details more than some people want to go, but I think some people want to go there. Um, but there's generally two routes to having a development approved. And one is that you go as of right, which means basically you read the rules and you check all the boxes and then you can build what you want to build. And it really has nothing to do with what the neighbors think. It's you know, either follow the rules or you didn't, you didn't follow the rules and get to uh, go ahead. Uh, the other way, which is sometimes called a development agreement, is a discretionary process where someone is an applicant and comes in and says, you know, I want to do this thing, can I do it? And staff say, you know, they might say maybe or probably or we think so. Uh, but in the end, it's actually the call of council to make the decision on that discretionary process. And these are the processes that take a year, two years often. There's a lot, there's public meetings. There may be lots of debate. And I wouldn't suggest that those processes always make for better buildings. They often make for a lot of argument, <laughs> but they don't always result in better buildings, those discretionary processes. The other thing that's tricky about those is that if you're a developer uh, and you're investing in a project, it's really good to know what you can actually do before you buy that piece of property. If you think you can do something, but you're not sure, that raises a lot of complexity. So, uh, so Halifax, for example, uh, most of the development that's happened in the last 15 years, up until about two years ago, 
was almost all through that discretionary process where every project had a one off decision. So I think there's a there's something there where there's more discussion on each project, but there's also a risk to that where it it might not get you the end result. Here. The current process is so time consuming; you'd have to be insane to embark on it, basically, or extremely desperate. So I mean, if, if and we another huge factor is the Jane Jacobs thing. Like we're attracted to a bit of messiness. Mixed use is great, yeah. but when you put it to people, nobody wants it in their, you know, not in my backyard type of thing. Well, it's like we're getting, I mean, like one thing is on the ferry to Tanto, like, okay, go rationalize it and stick it in Blanford. And yet that ferry dock, you know, apart from any other factors about whether Tanto people like to get off the ferry in Chester, like it adds a certain, okay, it adds a richness to the village. It's interesting. Okay, it creates a parking problem. Okay, you know, it's it's not. Um, anyway. it's it's right. Right. Yeah, yeah. That, big time. That's on our I do want to open up. I know uh, I have a lot of conversation here, but is there uh, folks who have said a little bit less? I want to invite you to have your piece as well. <laughs> you don't need to be an observer, but we can also have side conversations too. But I'm glad you're here. <laughs> Uh, and I'm just kind of conscious of time. I think we had intended this meeting to go until eight o'clock. Uh, I think we're happy to stay for a few extra minutes right now. It's about five minutes too. Uh, but I have just kind of one more set of questions and topics on here. I think this is related. And also, I'm sorry, was it Helen on virtually? Julia. 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 Sorry. And she I know what Helen did. That's why I <laughs> is afraid of how much she is agreeing with Nicholas. All right. Uh, so this next one is really about the evolution of the village. Uh, putting that out there, which is uh, what are the housing choices? that should be uh, incentivized or allowed for in, in the village. So, you know, on the one hand, there might be an idea that all new development should only be one family houses and that we should have no more duplexes. The other hand is allowing townhouses and apartments. Uh, what's the, the variety of houses that are, are needed in Chester in the future? And how can those be in a form that complements the uh, the character of the village? Uh, so that's kind of being that question of you know would townhouses be appropriate or not? Uh, and I'm not sure. I'm not saying one way or another. I don't really have much of an opinion. But I, what I do know, what I have heard is that there's a shortage of workforce housing. So if you are you know, a server working downtown, it's really hard to get housing. Uh, we heard a story at the meeting this afternoon, which is that some people who traditionally had rental apartments uh, are now only renting them throughout the winter and then in the summer they convert them to Airbnbs. So if you're looking for 12 month accommodations for a renter, you can't get it there anymore. Um, that's an anecdotal story. But when thinking about Chester, how do we also think about the housing needs of, of the population? Um, and I would say part of that is also my mom recently downsized from her large house to an apartment. She loves not having to shovel the snow, leaking in the garden, or climb up the stairs. So for an aging population, are there options to live in in the community that you grew up in? Yeah. I think no, 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 yeah. So I mean, that's a question. Like that's something that we noticed when we were uh, driving around and kind of looking at maps. Like, oh, there's this townhouse development it's just outside the village. Uh, and I'm sure if that was proposed in the village, it would either not been allowed. It is in the village planning area. Oh yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Sorry. In the central village area. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah, yeah. different it's zoning. Yeah. Just not. Oh God. It's yeah. gonna kill Chester. Right. And 
So the wife was a party. Yeah. <laughs> That's where all the first wife was. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I think I think when we speak about Chester, or sorry, about character, uh, I would say we should discount uh, things like housing needs and hand flutter. Uh, and then other topics which you know maybe have not been as much of a conversation in decades past, but have really come up now is things like energy efficiency. Uh, so are there ways to incentivize new development to be more energy efficient, uh, as well as accessibility, uh, sort of a, a better a better chance to have uh, wheelchair accessible housing options, for example. Uh, and so I just want to skip to the next slide if we could and then go back to the you, you to accessibility. Oh, did I, sorry? Accessibility was on there. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, what's the. I'm furious about the accessibility guidelines because they're so broad mm -hmm. that you can have a 34 inch staircase going up to a second floor where you have to have all 36 inch wide doors. I mean, yeah. I've had quite a bit of experience with handicapped. And I think this law is uh, disrespectful to design. Yeah. Is that part of the building code? For yeah, sure. it is now. It makes houses are forced to be just a certain number of hundred feet larger and takes out charm of interior planning. Like there's parts of it that are perfectly excellent. Like you can have houses at grade, you can bring a wheelchair in and make main areas accessible. A hundred percent good. But for instance, absolutely every interior doorway, 36 inch clear, that's turning houses into gas stations. Like yeah. it's not well thought out. That's the key thing. A 36 yeah. inch door, I don't know if it's code correct me or not. Most houses don't have to have a 36 inch door. Take a stretcher, put them in the house, and whatever, face the 30 inch door, catch down, which is open, that's down to a 30 inch yeah. door. Yeah. Double fingers. Once you got set of steps, how do you watch the jump down? Yeah. You know, how are you going to build a ramp? 36 inches, it seems to get out. It seems to be large. Yeah, that's right. I see what they're saying. Yeah. Simplify. Yes. It's just. Is that a municipal? No, no. So just to get out of that one. No, I just wanted to make it clear because that that is that's a provincial. That's, That's the office of the fire marshal to building code, code. building code yeah. in Nova Scotia. Now. So every every municipality will be stuck. Oh, I shouldn't say stuck, but every municipality will be enforced with the same provisions. That we don't we don't have the option to opt out or anything. No. So unfortunately, that's beyond the scope of this project. Right. Uh, but but an interesting comment. Interesting comment. Well, yeah. that, um, yeah. There's a good example in Newburgh, in which a lot of the rough openings for doors are five feet, um, and what a lot of houses have is a half door and then a full size to the next door. Next time you walk in a room you can see it. So in normal use, one door can be open and that can be a 32 inch door, a 28 inch door. And then the other side that has the option of being closed or open. Yeah, but when you're laying out a house, it makes a section of the house that might have previously been a little tightly tessellated now all of a sudden makes the whole house a few hundred feet bigger, and the question is whether it makes sense on the interior. I don't know if it's common sense. Yeah. And I mean, anyway. no, I, I think that's actually a good one because it also shows those little small, what seems like a small thing. Like if you stop someone on the, on the side of the road and you ask them if 36 versus 30 inch doors made a difference, they would say no, it's made a difference. But then when you accumulate that across the building, it some actual significant things. So I, I think it's that those little details. I, I, I recognize that. So we get no so that's and I'm seeing and hearing everybody tonight saying what can we do to change this? 
and was running out of space and was running out of good ideas and talent. We had a village that was owned across the north. If we extended the village to there, we could have many more. This village to me is sacred and it's historic. Let's go over down and try to do more interesting things. We can and we need more ideas. So, that was yesterday evening reading for the chapter. Oh, I said that this is yesterday. We're going to be kind of seeing how to the village. Oh, geez. <laughs> You're throwing David into the ring on that one. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't have that background. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so just to just to repeat here for the for the folks online. So the, the, the question was about, you know, should we be looking to preserve what's here in the village and, and, and look outward to expand? And uh, yeah, I think that's a, a fair a fair point. I mean, from a, uh, a regulatory standpoint, we've got two different plans, but one council that deals with both of those areas, certainly. And um, but but yeah, no, absolutely. Well, anything north of this, I mean, you know, we have a lot of land. Yeah. And and to that extent, the zoning once you get outside of the municipal plan does open up significantly yeah. in terms of the architectural provisions are are no longer there, and we actually. Last night had a had a really interesting meeting at the municipal office about a new development on Stanford Lake of potentially up to a couple of hundred new housing units there. So to your point, that is kind of already happening in terms of those larger uh, developments maybe on the, the periphery. Yeah. But, you know, I can see this that peninsula area that you have on your map. The historical place and maintaining that. Yeah, I can almost divide what it, the estate zone, the Financial Times defines first tier international, like prestige property as unobstructed views, like very special places. There's a band of the estate zone that really is like international top tier prestige property. And then there's other parts of that estate zone that are not quite the same, unobstructed private. Less market though. Yeah, that's. Yeah, that estate zone is very interesting because it's. Um, and that's the economy of Chester. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. The, Everybody the, up there is like, oh, those damn rich riches out there. Yeah. <laughs> and then they, oh, who supplies all the. <laughs> who pays yeah. for all the maintenance? Uh, I wanted to touch base just on next steps uh, in the beginning of the presentation. And I want to thank you for also for sticking with us for a long time. Um, but our next steps in this project is we're going to summarize the feedback that we've received here, uh, as well as from our other discussions that we're having. Uh, and we're going to try to distill some objectives and some recommendations that have come out of this. Um, what I'm seeing is I'm seeing sort of different perspectives, some perspectives around kind of heritage conservation district idea, some perspectives around scale, some perspectives around having more of a committee or discretionary conversation around projects. So I think there's my sense from this work is that we're getting lots of different opinions and different options for how we can go about the work that we're doing. Um, but our next step in this project is to develop, is to sort of synthesize the objectives that we've expressed here and to produce uh, recommendations coming out of that or maybe potential options for next steps that come out. Um, and that is what's going to be happening in the coming month or two. And we will have another session. Uh, we'll probably do a Zoom meeting. Uh, so a Zoom video that anyone who has an internet connection can, can log on to. Uh, but we are looking to have that in the next, next few months uh, to start to discuss those potential recommendations. There was a there was a uh, checklist form, and I threw up my hands because it was a little bit too much uh, multiple choice. Uh, yeah. If I was just going to write my thoughts down, is there any utility to addressing that to somebody? Yeah, uh, two ways. Do you prefer handwriting or typing? 
<laughs> we do have, uh, I have some sheets that have some of the topics that we have here, uh, but there is also a survey on the website. Or type it. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, you can no, send I, me an email. Yeah. Um, oh, oh, yeah. 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 I can give you my email address. Okay. Uh, yeah. That would be probably the easiest way. I don't bring it into the record. Right. Sorry, really driving the agenda backwards. One thing that I'm going to barely touch upon, I think, is the charge from the office. So. Yeah, I spend a whole bunch of time. Yeah, and I think the fact that the part that you give me to trust me, so we don't end up with uh, you know, endless gold receipt balls or timber balls. We have the appearance of a house from the office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So anyway, I, I think that the chest that's on the water is a big tip deal that really needs attention in order to find what she's out here. Yeah, certainly. And that break water, but we just kind of had that concern. We just didn't need to do it. That's what they call it. It's strong. It's a high tide. Yeah, so we just need to do it. It's a lot of water. Yeah, so we just need to do it. And that's a lot of that's uh, jurisdictional issues and that's so be at all and so on yeah. in their jurisdiction rather than in the Well, thank you everyone for coming out. I really appreciate the conversation. And, uh, you've given us lots to think about. <laughs> you haven't made our jobs easy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> 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 <laughs>